Good evening. It's now 6 p.m. and it's time for our governing board regular meeting. And I call this meeting to order. Can I get an adoption of the agenda? So moved. Second. It's been moved and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And now we'll stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The next item on the agenda is the approval of our board minutes from the regular meeting on April the 20th. Can I get a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 5-0. The next thing we have our summary of current events and we will start with the uh, superintendent, Dr. Holmes. Thank you, President Luton. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, before we do our presentations, I just have a few updates for the board. Uh, summer school, uh, the Summer Academy update, we are close to 800 students who have signed up for the Summer Academy. Very excited about that. Uh, we're still looking for a handful of staff members at the elementary level. Uh, and uh, student uh, registration will end in about a week, and we'll be putting that out to uh, all of our parents so that they are aware. Uh, but uh, we, we believe that we will uh, surpass 800 students who will be participating, and that's a it's very good news for our community. Uh, next week on May 12th, there will be a retirement celebration uh, held here at uh, under the Ramada, right outside at the Rothery Education uh, Center. That will start at 5.30, and board members, you are invited and encouraged to attend. Uh, that will be sponsored by uh, the CRS Education Foundation. Thank you again. Uh, also that week, on Tuesday, May 11th, uh, just a reminder that we will have a work session uh, for the governing board. It will be held in this room from 4 to 7 o'clock. The administration will be sharing uh, academic goals with the governing board and also our plan to achieve those goals. So that will be here from four to seven. Um, we will also uh, have this weekend uh, a great activity here at Rothery. The Buena CTE will have a career fair and that will be Saturday, May 8th from nine to 12. Each of our CTE academies will be showcasing their programs and uh, offering some demonstrations. Of course, we'll be practicing social distancing, so if you can come out Saturday morning in between your shopping, please do so. <laughs> um, this week, I uh, put a video out to the staff talking uh, a little bit about vaccinations and encouraging folks to, to uh, get vaccinated. Also, uh, sharing uh, some information about the summer academy. Um, so I'm um, hoping that most of you folks have a chance to watch it. Um, I don't look good on television where they said it adds eight pounds. Uh, for me, it adds 80 pounds. So I'm trying to avoid those videos, but thanks for watching if you did. And uh, I will be making up little rubber things to throw at the screen for the next video that I put out. So we'll have those. Uh, as you may have heard at Buena High School, uh, Mrs. Hale has resigned. Uh, we wish her well and her family well, and thank her for her service uh, to this district for uh, many years. Um, I have asked uh, Mrs. Nicole Young to remain as acting principal. Um, she has been serving in that role since December, and um, we will be starting the search process in the spring. Uh, the search process, if I can just take a couple seconds to describe it as to why we want to hold off a little bit. Uh, once we post an administration, uh, administrative position, that usually stays up for about a month. 
Uh, and then it takes about a month to go through the process of onboarding someone, the interview process. And if we were to start that now, we wouldn't be bringing in a principal at Wayne until July, uh, which is the beginning of the school year, which uh, becomes a really problematic situation. So because of everything that we have been dealing with this year with COVID and with people uh, being out, um, I thought it would be in the best interest of the district and of the school to maintain uh, the uh, leadership that we have there and give us as a district an opportunity to advertise and recruit and have a very comprehensive um, interview process where we will be involving students and staff and parents on the interview team and it will be something I think that will be good for the school district and, and a good way to uh, uh, kick off a, a new a series of leaders at Boynton High School. Uh, so we will be uh, working on that throughout the year. We're going to start uh, in early March of next year with the uh, posting, and hopefully we will have the interview process completed uh, by the end of April. At this time, I would like to have Mrs. Romo, who will be giving a presentation regarding the district Teacher of the Year Awards, which is why we have all these lovely people here tonight. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, this is one of my absolute favorite evenings. Anytime we have an opportunity to take the time to celebrate the hard work of teachers, um, it's an exciting day for me. So um, I just can't thank you all enough. I always say, who would have ever thought any of us would have experienced a year in education like we have in the last year and a half, right? Amazing work. The, the learning curve was huge for our kids, for, for all of us, um, and we just cannot thank you all enough. So um, thank you all for working so hard, and we know that um, there's lots of teachers of the year all across our fabulous district, but um, you all just really stood out, and you deserve this recognition. So let it soak in, because you don't get to do that very often. So um, I would like to thank the Education Foundation, who is here this evening, um, of Sierra Vista, represented by um, Chris Hagerl, Dr. Hal Thomas, we have Carolyn Humphrey, and Terry Rothery. This room is in her honor, her husband's honor. Um, thank you all for being here. They're going to help recognize um, our um, site level teacher of the year with a, a little certificate, a little letter, and I think there's something special for each of you um, as well. well monetary recognition as well, which never hurts, right? <laughs> um, and so I would also though like to recognize um, here in the crowd um, our Coaches County Teacher of the Year from last year, Ms. Leslie Nogales, um, who represents <laughs> Thank you so, so much. You did a fabulous job. Um, had the opportunity to be able to hear her speak um, at the awards assembly. It just did a beautiful job and really captured um, what an unusual and crazy year this has been, but uh, you did a fabulous job, so well-deserved recognition. So um, I would like to go ahead and welcome up uh, Dr. Holmes, and I think our board president is going to join here at the awards table. Dr. Holmes, one of the things I love about him is he said, I love to do things and have traditions, but I'm really all about let's make them even better. And I'm like, I have no problem making things even better. I'll let you guys go ahead and go around around the front. And so he said, you know what, these folks don't just need to just get recognized a certificate, nothing's wrong with a certificate, they deserve plaques. <laughs> and so he wanted to be able to get plaques and he wants you to put them up in your classroom so that um, you deserve to be recognized. And so um, we hope that you will do that um, and we appreciate that. I'm going to read a little bit about you. Also, I know I think the um, Education Foundation, you guys are going to come up, so why don't you guys kind of stand on the other side there. So if you, when you get to come up, you get to get recognized by lots of people because your principal's going to come up too. So, um, so lots of great recognition tonight, but well deserved. So we're going to start out. Each school site has recognized their teacher of the year, so we're going to call them up um, by site. So we'll start out um, with Bella Vista. Please help me welcome Ms. Joy Tautry. Yeah, <laughs> we'll be covered safe. And we'll give her her plaque. 
And while she's walking out, I'm going to read a little bit of um, something from each of them. It says, throughout this, this is written by Joy, throughout this journey of teaching, I believe the sole reason for my success is having high expectations for my students, because I believe they can achieve. It makes them believe it too. They are then able to reach those high expectations through goal setting and hard work. Their scores on the annual testing provide concrete evidence of their achievement. Another round of applause for Mr. <laughs> to take opportunities for these photo opportunities. All right, big smile, that's the nice one. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations. Can I go through our elementary schools in alphabetical order? Let's welcome up Carmichael's um, site level teacher of the year. Please help me welcome Crystal and Kimball. <laughs> from Chris on her um, principal bowl, Miss Michelle Hall, that's coming up. This is something that she's written. She goes, my own growth journey reflects my teaching philosophy that I teach the whole child and all students have strengths and areas for growth. I build relationships with my students that last beyond their year in kindergarten and seek to meet not only their academic but social and emotional needs as well. Negative stigmas about students are kept at bay by continually reminding students that we are all learning to get better at something. Whether it is letters, long vowels, counting, addition, writing, behavior, shoe type, anything. I give students time to reflect and self-assess what they are masters at and what they are still working on. When I refer to what students do not know, I intentionally use the word yet and model making mistakes myself. We celebrate both successes and mistakes that we learn from. I encourage students to believe in themselves by asking them daily, can you do it? To which they respond with alternating fist pumps in the air, yes, I can. We are growing to be outstanding together. Ms. Chrislyn Kimball. <laughs> we have to also call group in for a group photo. <laughs> One more. One, two, three. Perfect. And, I, yes. and one of the things that we're doing is we're recognizing the service to teachers a year, but these also these nominations also go forward to the Cochise County Teacher of the Year. Um, and we're very proud to say that Crystalyn was not only the elementary teacher of the year, but she also won for Cochise County Teacher of the Year. So, <laughs> We're not bragging, but that does make two years in a row. <laughs> <laughs> so, wait a um, Our next teacher of the year comes to us from what you come out. Please help me welcome Miss Angel Rose. <laughs> and her principal is Miss Martinez. Read a little bit about from her. She said, My philosophy of teaching is student centered. Everything I do, I ask myself, is this what's best for my students? If the answer is yes, then I proceed. If the answer is no, then I take a step back and reevaluate my thinking. Everything we do in my classroom has purpose and a reason. There is no busy work. It is all necessary to learn. I believe that all students deserve a welcoming and warm educational environment where they can grow mentally, physically, emotionally, and socially. Every student is unique and has something to offer to all of our learning. My role as the teacher is to guide and facilitate, not to lecture. Students must have hands-on conceptual learning experiences to solidify their thinking. Students should be able to question and inquire to direct their learning. Technology will be included as this is an important part of the 21st century learner. All students are welcome in my classroom regardless of past failures. Every student can succeed and will achieve their highest potential. Let's give it up for Ms. Angel Rose. High expectations are in place to help them push the boundaries of their own academic progress. 
Students in my classroom are in charge of their own learning, even at the kindergarten level. Giving them the option to continually expand their learning is just a small piece of what helps students go on to be successful. Being a successful teacher is a team effort that includes the students that you teach. The students in my classroom have helped me become the teacher I am today. They push me to develop new ways of teaching and they help me see the world from a different perspective. Most importantly, they make me laugh, smile, and sometimes cry when I see how far they have come and how hard they have worked to make it happen. This is PBS's Teacher of the Year with Sabrina French. sort of super exciting that elementary division they recognize um top three and we also had Miss Serena so out of those three two were from service and both kindergarten teachers so from town and country elementary school please help me welcome Miss Tammy Jones Tammy wrote, in my eyes, teaching involves knowing each student and their learning differences, which includes the students' diverse beliefs. Every person has the right to the feeling of belonging, both in and out of the classroom. A teacher must create a classroom environment that fosters a sense of belonging. Ultimately, my job as a teacher is to give students new experiences, the wisdom to grow as a learner, and set high standards that each, meet each of my students' potential. I believe that each child is unique in his, her way, and that they all need a safe, caring, and motivating environment to grow emotionally, socially, and educationally. However, it is a student's job to turn in work, try their hardest, and be respectful. I try to focus on good behavior and attitudes instead of solely focusing on misbehavior. I want my children to know it's okay to make mistakes in the classroom. Having a good rapport with every student and parent and building motivation and self-esteem is a great way to establish a productive learning environment. In the end, it shows respect for the student. Respect shown is respect earned. Let's give it up for Ms. Tammy Jones. Um, and I love because when I was at PBS, Tammy Jones um, worked as a paraeducator and just continued learning. And I always knew from the minute I met you that you would be a teacher one day. So, so glad you can finish that. Um, our next um, elementary teacher of the year from Village Meadows, please help me welcome Ms. Lisa Owens. I'm going to read up this up from her right here. I have learned that I can't do this alone. It's essential to reach out to peers, parents, and experts. Some of my favorite moments in teaching came from what I learned from others. What I gained from collaborating with others is priceless and always eye-opening, from my peers to my students and their parents. I am an outstanding teacher because I truly believe in your soul's quote that one cannot teach to the mind without first teaching, teaching to the heart. Every one of my students has something to teach me. Every one of my students can learn. It is my job to make connections with each and every student in order to truly understand what they need in order to grow and learn. Let's give it up for Ms. Lisa. to Joyce Clark Middle School, our Teacher of the Year. Please help me welcome Ms. Edith Mendoza. <laughs> and her principal, Roger Phil. Edith writes, every student is unique and learns in different ways. I teach in a way that allows all of my students to be successful in our classroom. Lessons that are hands-on, visual, and engaging allow my students to learn and have fun while learning. A different strategy that I believe contributes to a positive learning environment in our classroom is collaborative work. In our classroom, students feel like they are part of a community of learners. The sharing of ideas and new learning is encouraged. Many of the projects that are created by students require them to work in teams to complete the task. They must work together as a team to be successful. Involvement and engagement are what I expect my students to demonstrate while they are part of our learning community. I believe that this not only applies to my students, it applies to me as well. I'm involved and engaged in PD, 
professional development, so I can continue to learn and evaluate my teaching strategies. It is important to me to demonstrate to my students that I continue to work in, to gain the new knowledge that will help me become a more effective teacher. This is Ms. Edith Mendoza. From <laughs> that um, Edith Mendoza, um, along with Karen Sayers, were both top three in the middle school category, and Edith Mendoza was recognized as the county's um, middle school teacher of the year. <laughs> and last but not least, please help me welcome our Buena High School Teacher of the Year, Miss Vinnie Egan. <laughs> Miss Young is going to join her. Then he wrote, over the past year, educators have been faced with formidable challenges. Oh, actually, this was written from Ms. Hale, but I want to share this part. Ms. Heaton has worked tirelessly to ensure that her students had both the emotional and academic support they needed to strive in the ever-changing learning environment. She has taken on additional tasks this year in order to provide opportunities for English learners to master the English language. She has also gone above and beyond to provide distance learners with opportunities to receive support while still having the opportunity to learn from home. Ms. Hinkins cares deeply for her students and often searches for resources to assist those who are experiencing unfortunate circumstances. Ms. Hinkins is proactive and looks for ways to improve her instruction in the English language department program. Her drive to excel and her dedication to the success of six students are just a few examples of why we have chosen to nominate her for the Teacher of the Year. Please, let's hear it for Ms. Vinny. Thank you. Congratulations, everybody. And like I told you, Dr. Holmes likes to always shake it up a little bit and have things been done just a little bit better. And so one of the things that we did, he said, I know that the county does their competition and they have their winners and all that. He said, but we should have a Sierra Vista Unified School District Teacher of the Year. So all of the applications that came in actually went to a panel of, that was made up, it's actually a policy or a regulation, I guess it is, um, where we had three support staff members in. We had um, three prior Teacher of the Years um, from Sierra Vista come in and then three from the district level all judged separately, no conversations, anything like that, and they were just scored. And so um, we have actually an overall teacher of the year. It actually was done before the county um, actually had completed theirs. We just wanted to wait till our board meeting. And so it is my privilege to announce that the overall Sierra Vista teacher of the year selected by Sierra Vista employees is Carmichael's Crystal Campbell. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have to build a shelf, Ms. Swanock's going to have to open some space in your classroom because you've got like awards everywhere, so, but congratulations, um, well-deserved recognition, so, you can just smile again for now. Thank you. And this is going to be something that we're going to continue on from this year forward, and um, we're going to actually have a plaque that will have, um, Chris Lee Kimball is the first overall teacher of the year from Service and every year we'll add on the other winners. So again, congratulations to everyone. We appreciate you coming time. They don't want to stay for the budget. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody want to hang around for some excitement? Good evening. Good evening. Um, Dr. Holmes asked me to keep it under an hour. Hey. <laughs> I do my best. Let's let everybody know that they've heard that <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Is it not on? Okay.
Make sure your mic's on. I'm sorry. Oh, it is. Yeah, it's on. Can you hear? What a way to clear the room, right? I know, right? Say <laughs> budget, yeah. We should have said raffle. Yeah. <laughs> So good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Actually, three in one presentations. I'm going to start with our normal uh, first of the month financial update. This is our budget controlled funds. As you can see, this budget number here, uh, 31,999,532, is going to be our final revised budget for this year, 2021. Later on, we're going to, I'll go, go through some details on that, that number, and then uh, we will be asking you to uh, approve that final revised budget. We are currently in a negative budget balance. We still have uh, the need to move items out of m and into other funds. That will start compiling now, and hopefully you'll start seeing some positives. Because just to remind you, we are not allowed to go negative. Um, budget balance, that is in these, uh, uh, any levy funds. Levy funds are gonna be MO uh, and capital that we're really uh, paying attention to. But as you can see, capital, we're, we're fine. We have uh, a healthy budget balance there. Cash control funds. Here, remember, the cash balance by statute required to be positive. And for the most part, we are. It's our usual suspects of food service. Food service did take another hit. Uh, after some expenditures were posted. Uh, we are still negative in the uh, building renewal grant, but that's to be expected. And if it continues to be negative by the end of the year, we'll make a transfer um, through capital and then we'll get that back once the SFP makes those payments. So any questions on these two? I know they're the, the same kind of re repetitive numbers that you're gonna see every month, but. Do you expect the negative budget balance in the food service category to continue to go negative for a couple more months, or is this what you're projecting through the end of the fiscal year? Oh, no, by no means are we projecting this. It's going to go negative. More. More. Okay. Yes. And we're going to, we're going to talk about food service later on uh, in the presentation. That's actually our third presentation. So we'll get into detail there, but no, by no means is that where it's going to end. Uh, it did slow down since, since uh, December, but I'll wait and discuss that uh, in, in a little bit. Any other questions on our budget or cash control funds? All right. Something that we need to start putting into our presentation is the uh, flow balances. We're required to give you those updates. We haven't been ready for those. Uh, the account codes are cleaned up now, so we can start giving you those once a month updates on what each of the club balances are. All clubs at the district, $325,947.79. Healthy balances. Uh, kudos to, well, we don't have parents in the audience. Well, we have a parent in the audience. Thank you for, for assisting the, uh, the students with that. that. That means a lot for them. So what we'll probably do is continue this unless you have a different uh, uh, form you would like to see. Um, most of the elementary have one, two, possibly three clubs, so they don't take up the bulk. And I won't read each of these balances. You have a copy in front of you. Um, for the most part, elementaries do have their student council. Um, at the middle school, we have a few more. See they've got roughly $9,300 uh, throughout all of their clubs. And at any time when the club wants to spend money, just to remind you of the statute, uh, they're required to look at their balance, and they can only spend up to that point. They're not allowed to go negative. So if they want to spend more, well, then they're going to probably go to student council and ask for a loan. So this is cash controlled again. It has to be positive at all times. And then, of course, uh, it's actually quite nice to see how many clubs we have that have nice balances here. The students can do a lot with this, and they and they need to. They they raise money, and they should they should be using these for whatever they want. Hopefully, after COVID's over, they'll be able to do some more activities. The 
but as you can see, they, they do have uh, some healthy balances in some of these clubs that they can do whatever they wish. This is, this is their money. Okay. So we'll continue this format unless you, you guys want some other, other way to see the information. Didn't want to put too much on one screen because, as you know, the more we get on there, you can't see. But with this big new uh, projector, we can see most of these. Any questions on the club balances? Okay. Bond update. Same as uh, usual, we're going to go through this until the bonds are complete. Uh, as you can see, we have zero available. I'll see up here in a minute what, what that's all about. As we've discussed, as we pay things, it's going to go down from uh, paid, it's going to move from encumbered to paid. And as we issue those purchase orders, it's going to move it from the project column over into the encumbered column. We've had some big projects that were encumbered since last we talked, so that's why that balance is continuing to move down. Here's our voter approved categories. We're still well within our transfer amount, 488,000. We don't have that much left, really, that's going to be uh, moved, so we should be fine when, when all is said and done. And here are the uh, FY2021 bond projects that we've identified. I've added a color for you. This is this uh, dark orange color. Well, that's what it is on my computer. Those are the projects that are complete. Okay, so some of the big projects that we have issued, you might remember you approved the contract for the windows over at Village Meadows. So uh, we got that PO issue. We also have the parking lots. So we have a lot of projects ready to go because we have to do a lot of these projects in the summer. And several of them, we're gonna have some tight uh, time frames because of Summer Academy. So we'll be working with uh, with Steve and the person to try to squeeze those in. Okay, any questions on, on the bonds? All right, final revised budget. Again, that's what we, uh, we need to approve tonight. Every year, May 15th, it's due. Dr. Holmes probably would have not been happy with me if I asked for a special meeting, so I figured we, today would be the best time to get it done. Uh, our, but our general budget limit, like I mentioned on the, our first sheet for the budget control funds, is $31,999,532. Since we last had a budget discussion, we did lose some more ADM. Went down another 7.46, which equated to $32,958. We had a slight decrease of our distance learning decrease. So if you remember, we were originally, uh, the state decreased our budget limit by $974,000 because they did a recalculation based on us being back in school. It got reduced to a little bit, 16,000, so now it's only a decrease of 957. Once the school year is over, we're going to have an opportunity to resubmit what the final distance learning percentage is. And we, we might, we probably will get some more of that back. We won't get it back for this year. It's too late. We'll get it back in the um, carry forward calculations for next year's budget. So we're not going to lose the money. We just won't have it this year. So I'll keep you apprised once we do that final calculation. I'll let you know how. And then we did have a slight tuition uh, increase from Palominas. Palominas is what's called a type three district. They did not have a high school in their district boundary, so they tuition out their kids. They go to Tombstone, Bisbee, and us were the biggest one that they go to. We're required to give them an update, an updated bill, a final bill, I should say, by May 1. And we had some change in the calculation, which increased uh, the bill to 45,000. 331. So all of that, we did have a positive increase uh, overall to the budget. I showed you this last time. Just as a comparison, here's the ADM at adoption. Here's our current ADM. So we have a decrease of 450 uh, ADM. With our teacher in, uh, index 
and the distance learning decrease change, that's about $2.9 million decrease from when we adopted the budget last July. And to give you an idea, prior year comparison of just the ADM, if we were just flat at 6,700 kids, we would have seen an increase to our budget of $3.13 million. And again, to repeat from several discussions, most of that was made up from the ESG grant of 2.3 million and our carry forward. So we were, we were fortunate to have that large carry forward to go in conjunction with the ESG grant. That equated to a almost a 7% decrease in ADM since adoption and 10.5% decrease in ADM since the end of last year. Is that weighted or unweighted ADM? Uh, those are weighted. Okay, numbers. thank you. All right, moving on to capital because that's part of our budget. There was no change, no recalculation. We need the three million eighty-eight thousand six forty-five, and we had no change in the classroom site fund. Now I get a question all the time: How come those don't change? Well. Capital and classroom site fund are based on prior year ADM. So of course they're not going to change much. You might have a change in September, October, if they do some statewide recalculations, but it won't change after that. That's why those remain consistent and we can we can uh, pretty much go on those numbers. So none of the or neither one of these changed and uh, fund 11, 12, and 13, of course, all stayed the same. After we make those adjustments, I think it was a Any questions on the budget? I will be asking you to approve. Yes. Um, you raised an issue having to do with like a state limit. Not it's not a district specific issue, but a state constitutional limitation on funding. Do you know if there's been any movement or resolution in that issue? Right. That was the aggregate spending limit for uh, statewide uh, education. Uh, there's no movement on that. If they decided to reduce or eliminate that distance learning decrease, that would be a problem. We would be over, like, I think it was $138 million. But because of this statewide distance learning decrease, we're under the aggregate limit. So if they decide to give back during, because I, I do believe we're now only into the, the big budget bill. They can't approve anything else. So if they decide to change and hold harmless this distance learning, then at the same time, they're going to have to do something with the aggregate limit. They're going to have to do something with the aggregate limit regardless, because they certainly can't count on that reduction that's next year, I would correct. assume. Correct. That's definitely been in the works. And there were bills out there in both the House and the Senate that uh, did not, they passed each House, they did not go to the governor. So okay. We'll see if that actually goes forward uh, to fix this problem because we're actually basing it on, I think it was 1980 limits and then they adjust it each year, but of course they need to reset it. Okay. So yeah, if, if that does have any movement, well, as soon as they pass the budget bill, um, we'll bring that update to you and let you know what to expect. I'm hoping it will be before the end of June. Okay. Normally we're seeing it already coming to fruition. I don't think there's a lot of movement. We'll see. Any other questions on the uh, on the final revised budget? No. All right. All right. The big update is food service. We saw that big number. It's currently at a deficit of three hundred forty thousand five hundred eighty-eight. If you remember, in December we had our working group and we discussed ways that we might be able to rein this in. The big one at the time uh, that Dr. Holmes pr proposed was a reduction in, in force, and that did slow down the decline, but it didn't eliminate it. And it definitely didn't break, mean that we were breaking even. So as a reminder, just to keep this all in perspective, it didn't happen overnight, started in 2018, and these were the deficit spendings for each of those years. Okay. 
So without any change, as we discussed back in December and have throughout this whole time, if we do nothing, MNO will have to sub subsidize the food service to the tune of 340,000 because we're not allowed to go negative. And that's just where we're at today. And as you pointed out, that's not the final number. And it's usually in the range of uh, 50,000 a month is what we're going down. All right, so we discussed this problem and concluded that continuing to subsidize the food service program would require future educational program cuts. Right? That's a non-starter for, for us at the administration. So because that's not an option, what was the solution out there? If you remember in December, one of the things I mentioned was food service management company. Because we don't have the resources, knowledge to do proper food service at the prices that we need to. We just don't have it. So that's when we decided, after a couple of weeks, decline still going, we're going to have to look at this. So the question does come up a lot. Why didn't we discuss this with the staff? Right. First of all, we didn't know if the food service management companies could even help us. We had to go out to bid and ask them for this, you know, can you help us? This process is very uh, regulated by ADD, I mean heavy handed, and I'll go through what we had to go through to do this, but that is the reason why we didn't just come right out and say, hey, we're looking at this because we didn't want to get angst, we didn't want people to start planning, none of that. And it was unnecessary because we didn't know if it could be possible. So that's why we didn't just announce it. So because we would have to pay a food service management company $100,000 a year, remember we have to go out to bid for those, plus ADE requires it. So we had to go through what's called a request for proposal or a sealed bid. ADE, again, oversees this entire process. I can't even tell you how heavy handed they are on this. I've been through multiple RFPs, IFBs, all of that, and this is by far the most rigorous I've ever seen. I have not been through this myself. And with districts, it did, and just kind of ignored it because they handled it. Well, ADE handles it. So, they require us to be trained on how this process works. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what's my reaction. What? I haven't been trained? Don't I know this? No. Obviously, I didn't. So this RFP training occurred on February 3rd. We have a template that AD provides and requires us to use. So we submitted that for approval on the 15th of February. Finally, on March 3rd, AD approved the solicitation and it was sent out to bid on uh, March 4th. Pre-bid walkthrough was scheduled for March 17th. And we had six companies, and I don't know if there's any more or not, um, but six companies uh, showed up and did a site review. And then from there, all respondents had until April 5th to um, submit their sealed bids. This is very similar to what Ms. Romo had to do with her math RFP, but, and then some, because she didn't have to go through somebody actually approving every step of the, of the way. So from here, once, once we were waiting, we developed a scoring committee, right? And we wanted each of the levels represented. So um, Pedrada was representing elementary, Ryder Hill, JCMS. Nicole Young was the high school. Um, Alan, for his expertise at the administration level. <laughs> um, Benito, because he was you know, intimately involved in the, in the food service process. And I'll, I'll have to tell you that Benito was key to a lot of our questions. We needed, we needed to know, hey, what does this mean? And, and he was always there to answer the questions. And then uh, Phoebe, a uh, scout from my office, a procurement specialist, she was a rock star. She came in, this was a new position for her in the middle of this. this she didn't even know anything about our RFPs. And I think her second day on the job, she did the walkthrough. And then she managed us through this whole process. And it was incredible that she just 
picked it up and ran with it. So it was great to see. And then, of course, I was on there as well. This scoring rubric, just to give you an idea, was an intense 16 questions for each of the submitted proposals. And we all scored them individually. We came together on the 9th to review questions that we might have had on the uh, RFP, where to find things on the proposal. And we determined the three highest scores we would invite down for a presentation and for uh, food uh, sampling as well. We, when we met, though, one of the first things that we said was, can they even help us in their proposal? Can they say, are we going to break even? What it, what's going to run? Every one of them said that we would either break even or they guaranteed a positive return to the district. So that was very encouraging. We were like, okay, we can move forward here. The next biggest thing for us as a group was, how is this going to affect our employees? Right? We know that there's humans on the other side of this. How are we going to handle that transition if this occurs? And what benefits could be offered to the employees after we figured out those criteria in our minds, how is it going to affect our students? Right? That's, a, that's probably the most important thing we can do is if we're going to make this change, is it benefiting our students? And then what plans did this, the companies have for increasing program participation? We have to get the kids involved because if we don't get them involved, then the program's going to fail. Right? We have to have that participation. So we invited the three highest scores to participate in a presentation in food sampling on April 14th. Sodexo, Southwest Food Service Excellence, and K-12 by Elior. Food serve, we, we asked them to bring down some uh, food samples and we requested that they were reimbursable meals that would have commodities as part of the meal. Now the reason commodities is important is because the federal government gives us commodities for free. So we wanted to see how you incorporate those into those meals for the kids. Not for us, you can cater all day long and show us the fancy food. We want to know what you're feeding our kids. So that was very important. And then we were also able to provide nine questions for the presenters to answer at the uh, presentation. And of course, those questions had to be approved by ADE. Now, on a normal presentation, as Ms. Romo said, would tell you, it was kind of a back and forth. ADE, uh-uh. Those nine <laughs> questions, that's it. Don't ask a new one. The only thing we can say is, could you clarify that for me? That's about it. Right, Roger? Because he was trying to this one. Hey. <laughs> I am. Sorry. So on April 15th, after the presentation and food sampling, we then came together as a group final time to score a presentation, do a final scoring, and make our recommendation to ADE. So the whole package has to be sent to ADE for review. The contracts, the scores, the, you know, everything. And so that's why it took from the 15th to the 20th because PD had a lot of work to do to get those prepared and ready to send to ADE so they could review it. And then on the 27th, ADE approved our selection of Southwest Food Service Excellence. So, we're very excited to partner with them because they only do K-12 food service. We like that. We're not having to, you know, compete against hospitals or whatever some of the others did. They create meals that are 75% from scratch. They're student-centric. Transitional opportunity for our current, current food service employees. And I will tell you, once we were approved, when I discuss this with SFE, that's what we call them, I think that's what you prefer. I said, can you meet our employees? If the board approves this contract, could you meet tomorrow? So we're having a meeting tomorrow if the board approves the contract to get everything going. They know, and they're going to present and let you know from, from them 
how this transition will work, but it was important for us that our employees have this opportunity right away. No questions. We don't want a lot of angst out there. So that's going to happen. They've also committed to investing $124,000 into our program, and they are guaranteeing a return the first year of $161,000. So, all positives. Food was excellent. Presentation was excellent. Um, two of the three companies, the food was very good. One of them, not so. So, um, and from there, we're ready to go because as you know, we have a June 7th deadline for the Summer Academy. We've already discussed this. We're ready to go. They have a plan to how we can get this thing going uh, for Summer Academy because it's very important. We have to food feed our kids through the summer, right? So we're ready to go with that. Um, so any questions on the process, why we went this route, why we're making this recommendation. Yes. It's, so I assume at some point the discussions have been had that what we can do with our existing program couldn't match the the, the guaranteed returns on, on this fund to prevent having to continue to subsidize through M&M. Correct. I mean, one of the biggest things is you have to have uh, participation in the program. You have to change up your menus to make it to where the kids are going to want to eat. They're going to discuss here in a little bit how they actually poll the kids with samples. Do you want this on your menu? Would you eat this? All that kind of stuff. We don't have the resources to continue to do that. We don't have the resources to create menus that the kids are going to want. You know, it's, it's not, nothing against our staff. We, we're educators, we're not food service people. So when we looked at the model of how we are expending our monies, it, the biggest thing is food and staff. And I don't think we can cut staff anymore. We're already to the bare bones, so that means we have to cut food. Well, I, I don't know how to tell anybody to cut food. That's not me, that's not my, uh, and Benito, didn't have any resources to, to, to make things even better in the program. So I didn't see any way we could cut the decrease. Well, and I do understand, and I appreciate the concern over our existing staff. Um, and I guess I'm just thinking too, what we have to do this year with regards to staff is not something we want to have to do either. Like I understand that there's gonna be some hesitancy and questions and anxiety about making, potentially making a change like this. But again, what we had to do this past school year, I mean, I don't want to have to do that again either. No, and if we didn't do it to food service, then you're doing it to a program. That's probably even harder, right? Because we're supposed to educate. Which educational program are we going to cut to subsidize this? I mean, that's just the overarching question that always hung over our heads. How do we subsidize this? And there was no good answer. And again, we're not the experts on this. So um, I've, I've been with, as you know, a lot of districts consulting with them. And I don't know, I can't even count on one hand how many do their own food service. Sorry, I have another, one last question. In the presentations that you saw from the different companies, um, again, like for those that are in this business of providing food service uh, in Arizona for K through 12 students, I assume there's also some expertise in um, doing this job in these uncertain times. And I, I did the company sort of discuss their uh, experience and expertise sort of dealing with this past year and having to, you know, transport meals on buses and provide different to-go meals and just, just this extra. That wasn't a question that we asked in the presentation because they focused on our nine questions. However, I'll tell you almost every single one had it in their original proposal of how they dealt with that, how they increased participation, how they partnered with the community to create farmer markets, farmers markets to hopefully have mom come with the kids. And oh, by the way, since the kids are here, 
here's a couple of meals. So then we increase the participation and we get more reimbursements from the federal government. There's, all of them had some form of how they dealt with the, uh, the, the dealings of the COVID pandemic. Yes. And can yes. I make one comment? Yes. Because I have that question, the sheriff, about did we consider if we could fix this on our own? That what it came down to for me is these companies have the buying power that we don't have as a single entity. So that's really what it came down to in terms of the numbers. Um, I mean, and then we were talking about guaranteed, you know, income for the school district, which we haven't been able to talk about in a really long time. And, and this is one of the reasons why we reached out to principals is because they're going to make the program successful and they needed to know what's going to happen in their um, in their site. So that I thought because this was such a big decision, that's why we wanted to have them involved in this decision making. So, so thank you. Yes. Any other comments? No. Any other questions before I turn it over to Andres with SFE. All right, Andres, you're up. Let me uh, switch to the presentation. And good evening, everyone. Uh, first, I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to uh, come speak speak with you tonight and present uh, on who we are and really uh, our vision for partnering with the school district. Now, first, I want to thank the committee and the school district for their hard work. Putting out an RFP for food service is, I can't tell you how painful it is. <laughs> and then going through the process is just even 10 times more. And so I really want to thank for their time and their diligence and putting together uh, really um, a, a package that's most beneficial for the students. And we feel truly humbled and honored that the community uh, chose that we were the best choice for the district. So uh, first I want to start off with a little bit of who we are. Today here, uh, here today we have, uh, I'm Andres Montoya, I'm the Director of Business Development. We have uh, Chris Odom. He's our vice president, one of our vice presidents. And then in the back there, we have John Oakley. He's our director of area operations. John is also an alumnus of Buena High School. So who are we? So SFE is, stands for Southwest Food Service Excellence. We are a local company. We're actually based out of Scottsdale, Arizona. A uh, fairly newer company, we're founded in 2004. And really, we are a company that is led and run by chefs. And so, everyone uh, is truly food minded. Our CEO, uh, our CEO, Monty Staggs, is a chef, has been a chef for several decades. And he's extremely passionate about food. All he thinks about is food. <laughs> and so, and especially here to talk about child nutrition, really is inspiring. And so just a little bit about SFE and who we are, right? So we really operate off of four main pillars. The first one is that we are a food first company. As I mentioned, our CEO is a chef. Many of the company's leadership are chef. I used to be a chef several years ago. And many of the people who you might run across, uh, uh, run into at SFE were at one point heavily involved in the culinary world. And that really shapes the way we look at food and how we present food to children. The other thing too is that, as Kenneth mentioned, we are K-12 focused, where many of the other companies are, uh, are have their attentions divided between hospitals and prisons and other segments, right? We are strictly K-12. And what that means and why that's significant is that when we're putting together research and development, when we're investing in resources, we're not investing in 20 different lines of business. We are investing resources strictly into what's best for students. We offer customized programs. And what that means is that because we are a smaller company, we are able to look at a district and say, and, and, and say, all right, these are some possible solutions. But now we want to work with you and create a program 
that really engages and brings in the community, brings in the students, where the students have the say in what they're eating. We don't have a cookie cutter approach when it comes to creating programs for school districts. We don't have menu cycles that where we're telling students, this is what they're gonna eat for the month of May. Take it or leave it. <laughs> On the contrary, our students are heavily involved in our menu development process. Innovation in our DNA. Again, because we're chefs, we look at food service as restaurants, as from a, from a retail mindset. And so we're constantly coming up with new recipes, new concepts, whether it's from branding, whether it's from packaging, or how we present the food recipes, uh, leveraging technology, such as using food trucks, and you know, especially kids nowadays, right? Like if you were to ask most kids what their favorite network or TV show is, nine times out of 10, it's gonna be something from the Food Network, right? <laughs> and so we understand that trend, we appreciate that trend. And so we're constantly heavily involved in what's going on today. In a compassionate leadership, we understand that one of the concerns that the district may have is how the employees are being affected. And so we, when we're working through the process, of, especially through transition, we are, we are extremely mindful of how this can affect the employees. 2020 was already a terrible year as it is. Many employees were already affected negatively. And so we, we're trying to, we try to be sensitive while at the same time trying to offer opportunities. And so you're gonna hear more about that throughout our presentation. So SFE, right? I kind of started talking about who we are. We are a chef-led, food-focused company. Uh, and really everything we do is about food and what's best for the children because we understand that when the children come to the school, a nourished and well-fed mind is going to achieve much more things, it's gonna be more focused in the classroom, it's going to do much better than your student that may not have taken advantage of breakfast and lunch and other opportunities. All right. So I mentioned that we are a relatively younger company, especially compared to some of the other larger companies that are out there. However, we currently partner with 165 school districts across the United States. In Arizona alone, we partner with 35 school districts. I think more than half are, 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 are here in the Tucson area. We, we partner with more school districts in Arizona than all the other companies combined. And I don't think that's by accident. I think that that speaks volumes about, uh, about, the, about the type of partnerships that they were able to offer. We feed over a million students we operate over a thousand different campuses, uh, school, individual school sites, and we currently employ over 6,000 employees. So I'm gonna share a little bit about our operational excellence. So when we were looking at really what was going on financially at Sierra Vista and why, and why the food service department was losing so much money, uh, we noticed, so one of the things that we saw is that the district has a CEP program, which, which is a great program. It allows students, uh, it allows the district to feed more students uh, and without charging most, uh, many of them, depending on the school and their eligibility. Now, however, that was creating a financial imbalance. So what's the cure? Stop feeding students so that we save more money? Well, I don't think that's a choice, right? And so this is where, again, because we are a K-12 food focused company, uh, we have several hundred years of experience, <laughs> combined experience working just in our corporate office. Just in this room between the three of us, we have almost 50 years of K-12 experience. And so we were able to come up with a model that truly made sense, that we're, where the district was able to not only become profitable, but continue to feed even more students than before. And so again, that took, uh, a lot of collective minds and a lot, many, many hours of brainstorming and putting together really a business model that made sense that allowed the food service department to be able to feed more students while staying in the black. A lot of this is accomplished through curbside breakfast or uh, meeting students at the meeting students at the bus stop, improving breakfast menu 
so that more students are taking advantage of the breakfast program and possibly even incorporating a second chance breakfast. In addition to enhancements to the lunch menu, the second component was a custom culinary program. So creating a menu that's specifically designed for the appetites, for the palates of Sierra Vista students. Like we mentioned, we don't do cookie cutter menus. We work with the students. And so we try to find out what do Sierra students want? What do they prefer? What do they eat when they're not in school? Where's their favorite place? I have a 14 year old who will tell you her favorite food on the planet is orange chicken from Panda Express. Now, being a chef, I find that offensive. It should be one of my things. <laughs> but the reality is, like, you know, this is the info that we take to heart and we consider when we're putting together menus. And then we create menus that continually evolve. Again, palettes change. The food network will change. So whatever the chefs are putting out on the TV show is what we try to try to keep up. And again, the students are involved in every aspect. We leverage technology, whether the students are filling out online surveys, using QR codes, uh, Survey Monkey, you name it. We try to incorporate every aspect to try to gather as much data as possible so that we're putting out a good menu, a menu that the students will actually take. And the innovation that drives results, right? So we have to ensure success, SFE is making a substantial investment, and that includes bringing in resources from all over the country, uh, including chefs, including corporate trainers, including dietitians and nutrition coordinators. I mean, everything you can imagine, we're, we're going to throw at Sierra Vista to ensure the success. And a lot of that's going to be training, showing, uh, teaching the cooks how, teaching the cooks how to cook from scratch, teaching the cooks uh, our new recipes, innovative recipes that we're able to provide. And then from that, some. 76,500 will actually go towards new equipment, right? There's many things that we're excited about. One of them is a barbecue station, where we're going to actually bring in a grill and smoker at the high school, complete. And again, we're envisioning putting it outside by the picnic tables, but of course, we're going to work with the administration to see where do you want it. Remember, this is your school. We're, you know, we're a partner, and we want to be mindful of what, of what what's best for the students. We also would like to introduce an electric mini food truck, or I like to call them a tuk-tuk. And the cool thing about, those, about that thing is that we understand that for students, lunch is really more of a social hour, right? <laughs> so when they have their few minutes, they would, if they have a choice between standing in line and getting something to eat, or going and catching up with their best friends, we know where they're gonna probably go, right? But how about we take the food to them? So how about if we provide an option where they only have to probably walk a few feet, wait a few seconds in line, grab their food, and go? Another great concept about that is that we're also introducing SFE to go. The students are able to pre-order their lunch so that when it's, when it's lunch time, they can just grab and go. That's going to help ease the traffic on the lines. That's going to reduce wait times. That's going to increase participation and increase the satisfaction. We also are going to provide uh, a marketing refresh that includes digital screens. Again, our students are very retail-minded. They're used to seeing restaurants. They're used to seeing the nice flashy display screens, and they're used, they're used to seeing pictures. But it's not only that. Our students are also more nutritionally minded these days. They want to know what the sodium is in that chicken patty. They want to know how many calories is in that you know, burger that they're about to eat. They want to know where that lettuce came. And so that's some of the information that they're going to be able to see by us being able to utilize the digital screens, which, was, which is also part of the investment. When a student is able to make a more informed decision, they're more likely to make a decision. They're more likely to take that sandwich if they know more about it. And that's what we're trying to accomplish. And then one of the great things is that we saw that opportunities that we noticed was making enhancements to the faculty lounge. Now, again, how that directly correlates to student lunch, I don't know. <laughs> but one of the things that we do that we, we want to truly be a partner with the school. And so we understand with funds being decreased, that sometimes it's more complicated to show our staff appreciation, to show them that we care, to show them that, that we, we love them. And so one of the things that we wanted to help the district accomplish was doing those, these little things 
so that your teachers feel happier about coming to work. While the teachers are in a better mood when they're, when they're working with students. Any little thing that we could do, we're willing to do it. And so this idea actually came from, we partnered with Sunnyside School District. And we actually did this there. And, uh, and I'm sure John can probably talk to it in a little bit. But one of the things, one of the first things that we saw was an immediate increase in employee satisfaction from the faculty, from the staff. And so, in, and, and increased satisfaction with the teachers is, I think, something that all districts would like to see. And so, that's one of the things that we saw we could also have a, a, a huge benefit. And then the last thing, and I apologize, I know I'm spending a lot of time on this slide, but I also believe that there's some questions that came out earlier and that I think you know, that this might help. The last thing is the financial return. Well, $161,000. And again, this is gonna be through, not by cutting labor costs, not by really scrapping food, but by increasing participation. We're gonna increase participation by being more strategic about where we go to grow meals, about how, about how we uh, incorporate our investment and uh, how we really create a menu. So how do we accomplish this, right? As Kenneth mentioned earlier, there's not enough resources at most school districts that are self-operating. As a fee, because we are K-12 focused, we have a plethora of resources. We have folks that are working around the clock that are provide that are helping provide with new recipes that are helping provide with nutrition compliance with training with accounting with every aspect so that our district partners are successful with uh, are successful with their food service program so here's a quick snapshot of a similar district and how you can see how we were able to turn around their participation and in turn be able to improve the, the food service operations bottom line, right? And so again, we're focusing on increasing participation, not simply reducing the cost. So communications, what can you expect from us, right? So there's going to be a lot of change going on. And so real, realistically, everyone at the administration level should expect a lot of communication going from daily, weekly, and then eventually monthly, quarterly, to a point where the district feels comfortable. On top of that, again, this should, the district would have direct access to anyone from SFE, including our CEO, if they have any concern or any questions or anything they would like to see or know more about. All right, so as, as was mentioned earlier, ADE is very involved and uh, by law, they're required to do audits every three years. These audits are very, very expensive. And so every single aspect of it, from nutrition, from nutritional information to even the financials has to be covered and has to be perfect. We have a dedicated team of nutrition compliance coordinators that work with every one of our district partners. And this is how successful they are. Since 2004, we've had our, our partner districts have had zero findings. And so not many companies can say that. And so, but that just shows our dedication to our, to our partners. Again, I mentioned earlier leveraging technology. One of the great things that we have is we partner with NutraSlice, which is a, an app that students can download on their phone, not just students, but parents, to pull up what their menus are, what the nutrition information are. Uh, they could even actually favorite their menu. So if they see, ooh, Thursday's meatloaf, I'm gonna, you know, select that so that I make sure I remember to get it, when, you know, when I go to lunch. Um, they could even pre-order the food on their app. And the best part about it, they could even rate foods on the app. So if, if something is just their absolute favorite, you know, if they, they could heart it, just like they would on social media, and eventually that data comes back to us, and we say, hey, you really like the burger really hated that chicken sandwich. <laughs> and nutrition culinary education. So again, I mentioned partnering with, the, partnering with the school district, right? We're not just here strictly to feed students. We want to really be a partner with Sierra Vista. And so we want to be a part of your special events, of your parents' nights, of, of your of fairs, of homecoming, anything that really is a part of the Sierra Vista community, we want to be there. 
anything that helps bring in parents, that helps engage parents, such as in any holiday meals. Um, I know we have four pachuca here, right? And so something that we do that's a very popular in some of our districts that are um, that are part of military bases is that um, we try to do events where we encourage our parents in uniform to come in and have lunch with our students. At one of our districts, we have what's called, I think, Purple Up Day, and where it's a whole event really geared towards appreciate, showing appreciation to our parents in uniform and bringing them in and having really our students kind of feel, um, body them, they go embrace them, I guess, probably better way to put it. And again, we do many different things, everything from sustainable, from sustainable gardens to nutrition classes. Again, we want to work with the district and see what's important to the individual school site. What's important to Bella Vista? What's important to Buena High School? And this principal is going to let us know, this is what I want to accomplish. This is my goal for my school, and we will work closely with that person. <clears throat> So again, we are dedicated to feeding students, and so we want to partner with the district. With however, the district wants us to. That's best. That will help encourage and increase participation, uh, and really keep the families happy. But ultimately, that's what we want. We want happy students. We want happy parents, right? And we also want to be compassionate towards our students. We know there's students that are in certain situations that, and really, we just want to be that partner for the district. And so I mentioned earlier, I kind of touched on how we how we create our menus, right? Our menus are really student driven. We do everything from focus groups, we do our nutrition education classes, where we actually sit down with the students and find out what their likes are, what they're being, what they're conscious of. Maybe they want to, maybe they just, the students are more interested in locally grown. Maybe they're more interested in trying to do more vegan options. And so that's the kind of information that we learn from actually working and engaging with students. All right. And then building engagement with the students and the faculty, right? And so again, working with not just the students, but the parents, the faculty, the teachers, the principals to create programs that are really specifically designed for the students and for the school. And I apologize if I went back on this, but this is one of the really things that we're really proud of is the ability for the students to pre-order the food and to be able to pull up nutrition education information to have it on their hands. All right, now here's the good stuff, the food, right? So as I mentioned earlier, we are a food-centric company. At least 75% of our menus are made from scratch. And so we put a heavy emphasis on fresh foods, foods that are cooked on site or as much as possible, uh, working with local farmers, local vendors to really get that best quality food that we can possibly provide for our students. And then using culinary expertise, using our chefs, our, our chef-run company, our expert chefs to create quality recipes and menus that the students will be excited about. And so, we're involved in every aspect again, as I mentioned, family meals, summer feeding, we do school rallies, special programs, we do fundraising. We want to partner with the organizations to help do fundraisers uh, as I, and, and continue to really be a part of the community. Now, as chefs, we continue, we're, we're constantly developing new concepts that are very retail-minded and trying to capture the students' attention. Uh, but one of the great things that we're most proud of is being able to leverage commodities. Commodities are USDA donated foods or foods that we that the school district gets from the government. Now, why that's important is that if I have a dollar to spend on food, I have a choice of either spending it and buying retail or buying commercially from them, spending that money somewhere else, or using that money and buying and buying that buying that food product from the district. So now the money stays in the district, and that's part of how we're able to accomplish that $161,000 surplus. And so the great thing is here, you'll notice, I hope I'm doing it right, we are hand-pressing burgers. <laughs> There's not many companies that will do this because they just don't want to. But we are chefs, and so this is one thing that we're most proud of. 
This burger right here was actually designed by high school students. And so this just shows really to what level we, we engage our students work to where they're helping us design their own menu. This product right here, uh, pho or pho, depending on you know, how you want to say it. But, but again, we're, we're incorporating commodities. We're incorporating commodities as much as we can because that is money that goes back to the district. And just kind of another glimpse here, we have Baja Street Tacos with roasted corn. Grilled panini Cuban sandwiches. And then, here's my favorite, chile relleno quiche. I was well into my 30s before I tried quiche for the first time. And now we have high school students eating it for breakfast. How amazing is that? And again, these are the things that only SFP does. Okay, here's that burger again. And like, now one of the things, the reason why I have it up here again is the students created it. After the students created this recipe, we then surveyed the students. 249 students voted and it got a 4.47 out of a 5 rating. That's how we that's how we designed our student approved recipes. Here, again, keep in mind the retail aspect of the food presentation. And this is not a university, as you can tell from this child right here. This is an elementary level. We do this for all age groups. And then here we have handmade empanadas. And now I'm going to talk slightly, slightly about our innovations. So part of our innovation is a marketing refresh. And so we want to bring in the digital signage. We want to bring in the, the retail stations, the identifiers, so, you know, the type of stuff you would see at restaurants. Another big part of what, what, what we want to offer is the barbecue station at the high school. But the thing I'm most excited about is our electric food truck or tuk tuk. This thing will be able is, is is has many different uses. It could be used for breakfast in the morning to take to take breakfast most of the kids at the bus, even at the bus stop. It could be used again at lunch as a different station. Again, taking the meals to the students and capturing that participation. And here's just another example of the marketing. And again, we want to bring in all new, fresh decor, signage, bright, colorful things that are going to really help the students uh, feel that, that retail environment, that atmosphere. And again, this is just uh, what we call like an inspirational photo. But again, we want to create an environment that our faculty is proud of, that they're comfortable, that they're happy, that they're relaxed, that they can go ahead and continue to enjoy their day. And then we also wanted to provide office furniture for our, for our cafeteria managers. So again, as a way of showing them appreciation. Now, we have a great grant writing team. This year, they were able to uh, find, <laughs> I guess for lack of a better term, three and a half million dollars in grants for our district partners. And this team, this is all they do. They go out, they find grants, they help put them together for the districts, and then really they hand it to the districts so that for final signature. Uh, but again, this is money that goes straight to the district. And this is a service that we provide to our district's partners because that's exactly what they are. They're our partners. There is no fee, there is no, we do this because we honestly want to help our districts. Now this next slide, is something that's pretty neat, right? So we were asked the question, you know, what can you start, right? We're ready to start tomorrow. But one of the great things about being based out of Arizona is that we have all the resources just a couple of hours away. Uh, as I mentioned, we have 35 school districts here in Arizona, half of which are uh, here in the Tucson area. Uh, I'm available. We have dozens of folks that are available to come down and make sure that the transition is successful. Now, I want to point out this picture right here. I actually took this picture with my really bad broken phone. But this picture was in Gadsden Elementary School District in San Luis, Arizona. It's a very rural school district. They were, when COVID hit, they were struggling with, trying, with parents coming in doing, picking up the food. And participation started to drop. We were trying to, and we were trying to figure out what can we do to really try to convince the parents to make that 20 minute drive for, you know, a couple, a few days worth of meals. And so some parents were still doing it, many were not. 
So our grant writing team found an incredible grant, did all the legwork for it, right? And then get, you know, partner with the district and say, here you go. We just, obviously we need you to sign and submit. That grant provided the district with the means to be able to hire not just a nutrition, a dedicated nutrition coordinator, but also provide a farmer's market and the marketing for that. So then we were able to market, reach out to the parents and say, hey, we want you to come to the school to pick up meals for the students, but not just meals for the students, we want you to pick up food for your for you and your family, for mom and dad, for, um, for the uncles, for your grandparents. And they were getting grocery bags full of fruits and vegetables. And participation just immediately tripled. And it stayed tripled. And where most of the school districts were struggling financially because of COVID, because of a drop in participation, this school district saw a record, uh, broke records when it came to their financial performance. So now one of the important questions you had is employee transition, right? So we're, you know, we are very sensitive to this fact. You know, uh, we've done many of these. And so we know that there's a lot of, a lot of genuine concern. Um, there's a lot of change going on. Employees are scared. And so we work very closely with the employees. And so what Kenneth mentioned to us, you know, mentioned to us what, what was possibly happened. The first thing he said, We'll do whatever. Tell us what you need. He mentioned tomorrow that if, if the board approved the contract, that tomorrow we, the, um, that they would be meeting the employees. We're there. Anything we could help, we, anything we could do to help provide any type of reassurance, we want to be there. We want to be able to do that for our employees. And so the employees, we would be bringing them over at their current pay. There isn't. We're, we're not going to strip them down to minimum wage. They will be at their existing. And so, and we provide them great benefits. We provide them great PTO, great time off, world-class training. I'm gonna go to my next slide, talks a little bit more about that, right? So we're keeping employees at their existing key levels. All employees will have a job. All employees that are there tomorrow at the employee fair will, will have a job. We are, we've already started, you know, if, if tonight goes well, right? We already have people planning to be here tomorrow to be able to talk to the employees. Explain to them how our, the benefit system, our benefit system works. Explain to them how the transition is going to go out and really honestly reassure them, you have a job. You, you will be okay. Here's a, 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 but I think that speaks volumes to our highly responsive human resources, right? We didn't have to jump through special groups or get approvals from 20 different levels of people. I called our chief person, our chief people officer, and she said, it's done. That's it. We have one of the best coaching and mentoring systems for our general manager and who will be your future district executive chef. You will have a district executive chef. And because our company is made up of chefs, your managers will have some of the best training that, this, that exists in this industry. And we've already started working closely with Benito and, and, and really trying to find out, you know, what are some of the concerns that the employees are having? What can we do to help alleviate some of those concerns? But the last thing I want to end with is we are one of the fastest growing, well, not one of, we are the fastest growing food service management companies. With that comes more and more opportunities on a regular basis. And so for employees that are looking for advancement, that are looking for that next big position for that promotion, we have that available. There is no shortage of that. And not only that, but we're providing them with the training to be able to successfully take those jobs. And then, of course, the question of COVID, right? How, how were we doing during COVID? No district was able, no two districts were able to handle COVID feeding the same way. Every one of our school districts, one thing that we did do is make sure that the students were, were being fed. And so at every district, it changed. As I showed you earlier, Gaston Elementary School District, we had a curbside. We did a farmer's market to help bring in parents, to help make that drive, uh, to make it worth it, right? Here at Sunnyside, we were partnering with the school district in where we were doing, we we're using the bus routes to deliver meals. And because there was a healthy food fund, uh, we were able to help offset the cost of the drivers and the buses. Uh, we, we even had Wi-Fi on the buses, I think, right, John? 
So again, we are that partner. We are sensitive to what's going on. We're not just going to tell you, yeah, sorry, call us when it's over. <laughs> Now I, would, now, I would like to play this video for you, right? Because everything I'm telling you is great, and it sounds great on paper, right? But what does it really mean, right? Is there any truth to this? SFB made a live run. And the reason is I went to trade shows, and I saw the presentation that they had for the customers. And that's exactly what I thought it was, food for the customers, the, the people at the trade show. But then I was able to have a catering from SFB and several other management companies as well, and found that they do that trade show experience for our students, for the staff, for the faculty in our school district. And it's great tasting food, it's restaurant quality food, and it's 90% made from scratch. And that's what really intrigued us to contact SFP. And in July of 2019, we became partners with SFP. And they have taken that trade show experience and translated that into our cafeterias. The most important thing for us is participation by our students. And what I can tell you is since we transitioned to SFP, we are serving 6,000 more meals per month than what we did last year per month. So on average, consider that 6,000 meals more than what we served last year. Our students are participating, our students are enjoying the food, and our community and our parents are happy because they no longer have to bring food from home. Most importantly, we feel SAP is a true partner to what we want to do. We want to take our food quality and create a program that is innovative on the cutting edge, and SAP has partnered with us and has done a tremendous job of leading us in that direction. And I would highly recommend SAP to any school district that is ready to transform not only their food, but their food service program with quality food, quality products for their students, for their staff. Thank you, Andres. Um, does the board have any questions before we wrap this up? I know this is probably getting a little on the tired side here. Uh, and I'd hungry like, too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I would just like to thank the uh, committee again. It was a lot of work. It was compressed. They did a you know, yeoman's job to get it done. I was kind of a reason because I was leaving for a week, so we had to really hurry up and get it done, but uh, they stepped up and, and I think it paid off because um, to share with you, AD did tell me that this was the best uh, <coughs> packet that she had ever seen from the scoring committee. So that was awesome for them to say, for AD to say that, that was, that was great. So I do have one quick yes. little question. Just Reassure me that I did read that correctly. If a child's account fund is low, they still receive a meal. Certainly. So, <clears throat> char charge policies are set by the school board, uh -huh. not by a management company. Right. So it, it still remains district policy on how you want to handle those things. Mm -hmm. um, lots of times, if there is an alternate meal that the district chooses to offer, we make sure that we actually menu an alternate meal inside of our menu so there's no singling out if you will of a student okay um, they just merely pick the option they wanted to pick for the day okay thank you that's great thank you any others all right well thank you very much sorry it was a little lengthy and uh, i'll turn it back over to dr holmes thank you and that concludes our report this evening Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so now we'll move on to, with the governing board members' comments. Um, Joy, you want to start? Oh, thank you for the presentation and thank you for our, our budget report and stuff. Seeing the teachers receive their reward, their recognition that they so duly need and deserve was great to be able to see them individually and, and what they've done for our district. And um, I also want to thank the school for allowing me to go to the equity conference through ASBA. And um, just the refresher course it always is. And so it was good to see that and, and how our district and our board fits into what we're trying to do for our students. Uh, thank you. 
Kim? Good evening, everyone. Um, i just like to say congratulations and happy Educators Appreciation Week. I know it's Teachers Appreciation, but we're all educators, okay? No matter what role you're in. Um, so congratulations again to all the teachers. Um, hang in there, guys. We're only less than 20 days left. Um, as the teacher said in her, um, Ms. Romo read, can, can you do it? Yes, you can. <laughs> Uh, I, I also went to the equity conference. Um, I was very happy to attend. A lot to think about. Uh, tonight was so much fun um, to, to see faces in the audience, to see all the people who have been carrying out all the tremendous work. Huge congratulations to our Teacher of the Year and all the amazing teachers um, who are recognized tonight, um, and to all of our educators, like what you do and how you do it, especially under these really, really trying times, um, is so incredibly important for our students, for our district, our community. Um, I really, really loved hearing from the teachers, hearing what they had to say. I really hope we, as a state, start listening to those teachers. They know what they're doing. They've created something that clearly no one else can provide or recreate. We need to listen to them. We need to support them. We need to adequately resource them as a state. I hope we do that. What an exciting evening. Um, I, the only thing I really would like for you to have done was had some samples of this food. <laughs> <laughs> but I know you couldn't do that. But it certainly did make me hungry <laughs> looking at it. I think it's so wonderful that we were able to recognize our teachers. I think we need to do more of that because they, it is a really, really job, hard job to, to be that extra, that teacher that really, really goes above and beyond. And so it's so exciting to see that happen and that we were able to witness that and hear them and hear what their thoughts were and what they felt. So that was just wonderful. And I know that um, those teachers that we did recognize appreciative, but we do have many others that we could have. It's just not possible to recognize all of them at one time. But thanks, the administration, for setting all this up and the wonderful job that you're doing. Thank you, ladies. Just to echo off of that, um, congratulations, yes, to all of the, um, the teachers that were acknowledged and um, I just want to do a shout out for teacher appreciation for this week. Um, I don't know if you guys, teachers, understand what an impact they have on kids. And I know me being in this district, my kids going to the district, some of the teachers have had a big impact on me. And so just want to thank you all for that. And with that, we'll move on. We don't have any public comments for tonight. So we'll move on to the consent agenda. Can I get a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries 5-0. The next item is discussion and action job description of the speech language pathologist assistant, the code word SLPA position. I skipped one. Okay, let's go back to our policy consideration for adoption on the first reading. It is recommended that the governing board discuss and take action, action to adopt on first reading and under emergency conditions, the policy revision as recommended by the Arizona School Board Association for the following policy, policy IKFB graduation exercise. House Bill 2705, 55th Legislature, First regular session 2021, an act relating to local governance of schools was approved by the governor 
and filed in the office of the Secretary of State on April 20, 2021, as an emergency measure that is necessary to preserve the public peace, health, or safety, and is operative immediately as provided by law. Administration recommends adoption on the first reading in accordance with current policy, EGB. Can I get a motion? So moved. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries 5 0. The second item discussion and action job description for the speech language pathologist assistant SLPA position. It is recommended that the governing board discuss and take action to create four new positions for certified speech language pathology assistants, SLPA, to assist certified speech language pathologists, SLPs, in providing therapy services to students with a speech language impairment. The adoption of the job description is necessary to allow the district to advertise and hire a qualified individual to provide necessary services of the district's speech language program. These will be a nine month position and salary will be based on education and experience of the successful candidate according to the district professional staff salary schedule. The district does not currently have a specific job description for an SLPA. This position will be funded utilizing the IBA grant and administration recommends approval. Can I get a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? I have a question. Yes. Um, but this is an assistant, but yet there's, we're still, or I'm looking at the job description that's right below it in our thing. With that job description, are we going to be able to find certified people that have passed a certified test? Yes. To fill those positions? Yes, and there are um, SLPAs in the community already. Oh. And some, um, I know we have at least one applicant who would love to work for the district. Okay. I just, I know speech language is a difficult position to fill at anything, but to look at it as a, an assistant with those kind of qualifications would we be able to find it. So you're confident that we'll be able to find it. So that's good to hear. Mm -hmm. Okay. That was my only question. So the four positions, is it going to be two SLPAs and then? One SLP can supervise two SLPAs. Okay. And so they'll work together collaborative, collaboratively as a team to provide those speech services for the children. Okay, gotcha. Any other questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries 5-0. The next item is discussion and action description of a certified occupational therapy assistant CODA position. It is recommended that the governing board to state, discuss and take action to create two new positions of certified occupational therapy assistants to assist certified occupational therapists in providing therapy service to students who require additional support in improving motor skills. The adoption of the job description is necessary to allow the district to advertise and hire a qualified individual to provide necessary services of the district's occupational therapy program. These will be a nine month position and salary will be based on education and experience of the successful candidate according to the district professional staff salary schedule. The district does not currently have a specific job description for a CODA. This position will be funded utilizing the IDA grant and administration records approval. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries 5 0. The next item is discussion and action approval of district expenditures budget number three. It is recommended that the governing board discuss and take action to approve the submission to ADE of the second and final revision of the fiscal year 21 Sierra Vista Unified School District expenditure budget. Ken? ADE's final revision submission deadline is May 15, 2021. The revision presented includes updated ADM and tuition figures. And will be the final revision of the district's FY 2021 expenditure budget. The document will be submitted to ADE prior to the deadline and will be available via a link from the district's website. Administration recommends approval. 
Can I get a motion? So, second. Just to be moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries 5 0. The next item is discussion and possible action award of the contract for food service management company. It is, it is recommended that the governing board discuss and take action to award the contract for RFP number 521 FSMC-0526 Food Service Management Company to Southwest Food Service Excellence. Ken? After a thorough review of all responsible and responsive bidders, it was determined that the proposal submitted by Southwest Food Service Excellence was the most advantageous to the district based on the factors set forth in the request for proposal. The administration recommends approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries 5 0. Congratulations, guys. We look forward to working with you. The next item is discussion and action approval of vendor purchase exceeding the $100,000 threshold. It is recommended that the governing board discuss and take action to approve the expenditures exceeding the $100,000 threshold of Solution Tree Incorporated. Ken? The purchasing department must receive permission from the governing board before approving purchases that will put a single vendor's fiscal year total over the $100,000 threshold. Because Solution Tree Inc. is on a one GPA cooperative contract and has proven to be a quality vendor who continuously provide a support of professional development to employees, it is considered beneficial for the district to continue utilizing this vendor. The administration recommends approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries 5 0. Discussion and action approval of the fiscal year 2021 continuing resolution for Cochise County Treasurer Investment of Funds. It is recommended that the governing board discuss and take action to approve the submission of the fiscal year 21-22 continuing resolution authorizing the Cochise County Treasurer to invest service to unified school district funds. And school districts provide authorization annually for the Cochise County Treasurer's Office to invest district funds and interest-bearing securities in accordance with ARS 15-1025, as amended by laws 1998, chapter 233, section six. The administration recommends approval. Can I get a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Um, is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Carries five zero. The next item, discussion and action stu student expulsion recommendation. It is recommended that the governing board discuss and take action regarding the student expulsion recommendation provided by the hearing officer in the Wachuca Mountain Elementary School vandalism matter. Per governing board policy, JKE, the authority to expel a student rests only with the governing board. On 2nd of March, the board voted to appoint a hearing officer conduct the hearing and review the facts of the matter. The hearing was conducted on April 12, 2021. All required due process protocols were followed in accordance with policy JKE. The administration recommends approval of the hearing officer's recommendation. Can I get a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries 5 0. The next item is information and discussion items. Is there anything that you guys would like to discuss but not take any action on? Is there anything that anyone has? If not, then we'll move over to information items, um, request for future agenda items. Does anyone have anything? I, I, had, I had one. Um, I would like to request that we put on our next agenda um, 
the ability to discuss and take action on a submission um, from our district on the proposed issues for the ASBA 2022 political agenda. If, if we're able to take action by our next meeting, um, we could get those submitted in time. And unfortunately, uh, many of the things that we've been requesting have still not happened. And so we have the opportunity to potentially, you know, resubmit what we've been submitting previously. And I'd be happy to send some information um, to y'all outlining the process and what those uh, items are. Sounds great. Does anybody have anything else? Alan, if you could coordinate that with Holly, we'd appreciate that. Thank you. Um, if there's no other um, items for the an agenda, I need a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Um, is there any discussion? <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries five zero. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you.